Okay, can I take the opportunity to remind members that COVID-related measures are in place and that face coverings should be worn when moving around the chamber and around the Holyrood campus. The next item of business is a debate on motion 2442 in the name of Tom Arthur on Scotland Loves Local. I would invite members who wish to participate in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible or place an R in the chat function if they are joining us online. And I call on Tom Arthur uh, to speak to and move the motion, Minister, for 11 minutes. Uh, Presiding officer, I am delighted to bring this debate to Parliament, allowing all MSPs the opportunity to show their support for Love's Local, supporting local businesses, jobs and building community wealth. And now is a good time to reflect upon this in the run-up to Christmas. The last 21 months has taught us a lot about what really matters. We have all lived our lives a bit closer to our homes, appreciated what is on our doorsteps more, rediscovered green spaces, our local shops and businesses, and reconnected to our local communities and all they have to offer. Our constituents, communities and local businesses, the length and breadth of the country have rolled up their sleeves, mobilised and worked creatively and with agility to develop local solutions to look after one another and support those who need it. We have realised that being able to go to the shops and buy whatever you need is a privilege not to be taken for granted. Today I want to celebrate the contribution of our local businesses and communities to Scottish life in supporting us in providing opportunity and employment. And I ask Parliament to support us to do the same in return. But loving local is not only about helping people to live well locally. It also has so much potential to support our strategic ambitions for a just transition to net zero and for an inclusive well-being economy, as well as tackling inequality. It is about bringing the government's programmes together in each place to deliver shared priorities. Our joint ambition must be a future, which, uh, must be a future rather, which has good places and localism at its heart where we embrace local supply chains, build community wealth by getting behind local businesses and enterprises, support community regeneration, revive our town centres, grow accessible transport, active travel and services, work together with communities and move towards net zero in everything we do. Our shared experience during the pandemic has demonstrated the potential of local communities and businesses to use their local knowledge, expertise and commitment to successfully respond and adapt to big challenges in their own way. It has highlighted the extent to which local economies are determined by their context, the characteristics of a place and the people who live there, and the regional and national policy framework in which they operate. This is why we take a place-based approach. At its heart, any place-based approach is simply a practical way of looking at how to tackle challenges and take advantages of opportunities at a scale which is meaningful and helpful. To support places, we need to really understand the everyday experience of people's lives and respond with local initiatives designed to improve the lives of businesses and communities across Scotland and our cities, towns, neighbourhoods and rural and island geographies. So I'm, I'm pleased that we've been able this year to launch our Scotland Loves Local programme which aims to encourage people to think and choose local. This £10 million multi-year programme is designed to support recovery and influence behaviours, to embed the Love's local culture, which we started to witness during the pandemic. It encourages a, a safe return to our town and city centres, taking care to follow guidelines to look after each other. I am looking forward to seeing the benefits of that funding as I'm sure we all are. The, the funding enables projects which support local businesses to love local in the festive season. For example, digital trails in Oban, projects to improve town and city centres, such as streetscape improvements in Dunoon, a cultural and arts project in Helensborough, and a marketplace project in the Western Isles. I know that a head of small business Saturday last weekend the First Minister and the Economy Secretary Kate Forbes urged people to support their local independent traders this festive season. I'm sure, and I'm, I certainly will. Douglas Lumsden. Thank you. Uh, 
Does the member agree that all shops and services should be supported, including uh, butchers? Because um, obviously, I think the Green partners are against that. Minister, I would encourage. Um, I don't know what motivated that, um, and to be honest, I. I think this is an opportunity to celebrate our, our local businesses and local communities, and that's the tone I'm going to set out at the start of this debate. It will be up for the member and whether he wishes to follow. Um, and I would also want to encourage members, as well as supporting our local communities, to encourage constituents and, indeed, family members to buy the Scotland Loves Local gift card for loved ones this Christmas. The gift card is an innovative way of keeping spend local for longer so people can treat themselves to the best retail, hospitality and experiences on offer in their area, whether in store or online. The key thing being that any online has to have a bricks and mortar presence within the local authority area. In June, I was delighted to be able to launch the Scotland Loves Local Awards and really pleased to see the wide range of award winners who were presented with their awards recently at the Scotland's Towns Partnership Conference, which I attended. The awards recognise and thank some of the people working tirelessly to support the resilience and vitality of our town centres, whether through embracing creativity, commitment to tackling climate change, through to being a hero for their high street. I would like to congratulate all award winners and also highlight to you a couple of examples. So congratulations to East Ayrshire Council and Kilmarnock Business Association, who were awarded a judge's special prize in recognition of the wide-ranging impact of the local gift card to help fuel local recovery. And well done to the young people in Strathairn and Strathallan who developed a community radio station broadcasting locally. This reward uh, recognised the talent championed and the creation of a community hub, promoting local businesses, creating jobs, helping the local economy. And looking to the future, we are exploring the opportunity to support low-income households using Love Local Cards and a pilot project with Citizens Advice Scotland. This seeks to offer an alternative to food bank referrals alongside our primary cash first response to reduce food insecurity. This is an example of how we are working across portfolios on our overall localism ambition, which our Scotland Loves Local programme is supporting. Continuing with support for businesses across portfolio, we are, we are working with Scotland's Towns Partnership to support our local food and drink sector, to encourage retailers to buy locally and source more Scottish produce, and raising consumer awareness of our fantastic local offerings. And we have also worked on a range of initiatives to support local tourism recovery. This includes the Destination and, Se and Sector Marketing Fund, the Scotch Spirit Holiday Voucher Programme, which represents social tourism at its best, the Tourism and Hospitality Talent Development Programme, designed to motivate and develop local talent, and we have al also allocated £4 million to the Days Out Incentive Scheme. In order that Loving Local can become a, a long-term strategic approach, we are working collaboratively through our community wealth building approach, the draft NPF4, Housing 2040, the Town Centre Review and a route map to deliver car kilometre reductions, setting out our vision to create places that people want to live, work, enjoy and settle in. Places to thrive and bring up families, places that meet the needs of local, local people and support their health and well-being. And this is why we will take action to make housing and places work together seamlessly so people can live in communities and 20-minute neighbourhoods with ease of access to their thriving town and city centres via public transport and active travel. Collaboration and partnership is and will continue to be vital to everything we do. Our business improvement districts are a good example of Love Local and a mechanism for businesses to work together with their communities. Their hyper-local knowledge, leadership and partnership has ensured many of our city, town centres and neighbourhoods have remained resilient. For example, Stirling and Alloa Bids led strategic partnerships with their local authorities and chambers to ensure PPE and emergency grant support was awarded to their members. Bid for Oban led a town-wide communication and support campaign and also set up a business counselling service to support struggling business owners. And this service was then made available to businesses nationally. The action taken by communities in response to the pandemic was recognised in our COVID recovery strategy as a key part of the resilience of our communities. Communities used their distinct local knowledge, expertise and commitment to successfully respond and adapt to big challenges in their own way. 
Our vision for community-led regeneration, supported by our place-based investment and our empowering communities programmes, enables our communities to shape their own futures. The investment is helping them to develop community assets, enabling them to generate their own incomes and, in turn, supporting the creation of new jobs and access to services that benefit the people in their communities. Because we certainly. Jimmy Hawker Johnson. Um, thanks, thank the Minister for that intervention. Obviously, there have been successful examples across Scotland and others less successful. How many new jobs does he hope that might be created through some of the work being done, both by the Scottish Government and local councils, in terms of uh, regenerating high streets? Minister, and I can give you your time back. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I can't give an exact number, but I would just say, with regards to regenerating high streets, as much as that's an, an important aspect, I think we have to be more ambitious and look more broadly at the community wealth building model and the opportunities that presents, leveraging big spending public bodies locally to support SMEs, to support social enterprises. And I think what we can see is more money circulating within our local economies, moving away from that model of wealth extraction. The opportunities, I think, are really quite exciting. And I think that when we, as we advance the community wealth building agenda over the course of this parliament, I think it's something that all parties can come together and work on. And indeed, I want to commend the excellent work taking place in local authorities, led by political parties of all persuasion, right across Scotland in supporting the community wealth building agenda because, as I say, I think the potential for supporting dynamic local economies and, and job growth is, is limitless and I hope it's something that we can work on constructively throughout this session of the Parliament. And as I say, we, we cannot achieve our ambitions, presiding officer, without working with and for our communities, without real participation and engagement and harnessing our collective resources for local impact. Before concluding, I, I would just like to say that I am looking forward to uh, presenting the Surf Awards tomorrow evening, meeting some of the people who will be receiving these awards and hearing more about their endeavours and the conditions required for success. The, the awards provide welcome recognition for those who support their community to thrive, and that is what Love's Local is all about. Presiding officer, we should not lose sight of the sense of connectedness belonging and strength our local communities and businesses have shown. I hope members will continue to support the Love's local ambition and encourage their constituents to do so too, safely visiting local markets, shops and businesses if they can, and enjoying all their local neighbourhood has to offer. Presiding officer, I, I move the motion in my name and in doing so I commend all of us to think globally and live and love locally. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Minister, before calling the next speaker, I can advise the Chamber we've got a bit of time in hand, so I would encourage members uh, to make and take uh, interventions. You will get the, the time back. And a gentle reminder to those members who are looking to participate in the debate but haven't yet pressed their buttons uh, to do so as soon as possible. And with that, I call on Douglas Lumsden to speak to and move Amendment 2442.2 for around seven minutes. Thank Lumsden. you, Deputy President Officer. And I would like to remind members of my register of interest, which shows that I am still a councillor at Aberdeen City Council. It is absolutely the right that we recognise the contribution that our local producers continue to make to our economy and to the well-being of our communities. And I would just like to add my congratulations to everyone that is up for an award uh, tomorrow night that the, the Minister has mentioned. Because over the last two years, businesses and citizens have been hit hard by the COVID pandemic. If we take Glasgow, for example, we can see from figures from the Scottish Retail Consortium that footfall within the city centre is down 22% in November compared to the equivalent period in 2019. And this is a picture that we've seen replicated across Scotland over the last couple of years. And more and more people are switching to online shopping as a result of the pandemic with obvious consequences for our high streets. And today, President Officer, the Conservative Party are not just offering welcome words, but concrete policy solutions to helping our struggling high streets and food sectors. Uh, last month, 13 industry bodies wrote to Kate Forbes asking for rates relief for retail business in her budget tomorrow. Uh, these organisations have warned the Finance Secretary that the retail industry was potentially facing scarring from the pandemic for years to come and that many challenges businesses were facing would be insurmountable without direct Scottish Government help. And yes, I will. Fiona Hislop. Does the member acknowledge that in this year, the 100% rates relief for retail and hospitality has been far more generous than any other part of the United Kingdom? 
Douglas Lomston. Absolutely, and it's fantastic that the UK government has been able to provide the devolved government with so much money that they've been able to, to yeah. offer that. But of course, what, the, what, what businesses are looking for? What, what businesses are looking for is the, what's going to be in this year's budget, and to see um, relief go um, going forward. And the, the government need to listen and act on that. Uh, shop vacancy rates have had a six-year high in November this year at 16 per cent. Uh, the latest Scottish Retail uh, Consortium and local data company figure, uh, figures also showed that on the high street specifically, vacancies are still on the increase. And the Scottish Government needs to, to act on that uh, also. And according to COSLA, local authorities, who many retailers turn to for help, have had real terms reduction in general funding of around 20 per cent once additional obligations have been factored in. But instead of helping local authorities release funded for high streets, the SNP devolved government solution is to further ring-fence funding for projects that are at Holyrood Diktat. No longer can local authorities focus on local solutions to local problems. Instead, they have their hands tied behind their backs with ring-fence funding for national projects. The SNP devolved government talk a lot about partnership working, yet the one body that does the most to protect our high street than any other, I will do is our local authorities, and the SNP continue to reduce their funding hand over fist. I will take that. Jackie Dunbar. Uh, thank you for the member for taking the intervention. Does he think that the pedestrianisation that his administration in Aberdeen has pushed through in Union Street actually helps the local shops in that street? Douglas London. It, it, it's fantastic you've, you've, you've brought that up, because, of course, that pedestrianisation project can only go ahead because of £20 million from the UK government as part of their levelling up fund. Yeah. And, you know, it, 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 and the administration in Aberdeen is obviously looking to enhance the area where the SNP, all they have is talk and want to manage decline. So if the SNP were serious about protecting our communities, they would be giving the local authorities the fair funding settlement that they've asked for. And I hope, but I doubt, that the Cabinet Secretary will have any good news for our friends and colleagues in local government tomorrow. Of course, the last two years has not been the start of the issues for our local high streets. The challenge that they've been facing has been going on for the last 14 years. Many major brands have moved to out-of-town sites or online. Another example of the SNP taking their eye off the ball. To rebuild our communities from the pandemic, we need to tackle the long-standing problems which have emptied our high streets and undermined local businesses. High business rates, poor infrastructure, overzealous planning policy. We need to transform our high streets into more diverse places where people can go to live, work, eat, do activities and shop. But councils need government assistance to be able to do that. Local governments were given the ability to introduce rate rebate schemes, which as a, as a leader of a local authority, I was itching to use. But they were given the power, but they were not given the ability to raise any funds to pay for any scheme. This was just a way of the Scottish Government passing the buck to local authorities. The yes, I will. Minister. The member raises an interesting point from the perspective of being a leader in administration about having to make challenges around where money is allocated and the limited ability to raise funding. Does he recognise that that is perhaps the position that the Scottish Government find ourselves in? Uh -huh. And with that in mind, if he wishes to go and see further funding for local government, then what other portfolios would he take it? Does, for example, he still support all health consequentials going to the National Health Service? Douglas Lomston. It, it is rather strange that we hear an SNP minister talking about how Scottish Government can spend its money when we see the amount of ring fencing that local government has. If there was the same amount of ring fencing came to a Scottish Government budget, I'm sure we'd, be, uh, we'd hear about it rather loudly. Because uh, we need to look at ways to exempt high streets and town centres from business rates and relax planning laws for redevelopment in these areas. In fact, our manifesto was packed full of measures to help our high streets. These included changes to small business bonus scheme, delaying the introduction of new non-COVID business regulations until 2023, super-fast fibre broadband to all businesses by 2027. In food production, we promised a Scotland First approach, a national food strategy to promote local produce, doubling the size of the food and drink sector by 2030, a farm-to-fork review of Scotland's food policy as a key element of COVID recovery. The purpose of these policies is to boost demand for Scottish produce, strengthening producers' bargaining powers, supporting them to upscale and export better label Scottish produce, even clouty dumplings, and ensure that public procurement utilises Scottish produce wherever possible. 
because we want to pr promote Scottish produce at home and abroad without fear of a Twitter onslaught or threats against those businesses being made. And Minister, I would hope, I would ask you to join me today in condemning those who are damaging Scottish businesses by attacking them and threatening them on social media just because they dare to promote Scottish goods in England on Small Business Saturday. But colleagues, what we have here today from the devolved Scottish Government is a motion that contains no commitments at all, no policy drivers, no help for local authorities and no funding to help our worn out high streets. One shop owner in a small town in the Borders posted on Facebook the other day just how exhausted she was, how much the pandemic had hurt, not just financially, but emotionally. The sleepless nights of worry, the fears of another lockdown, the worry about her staff and her supply chains. It isn't just about the finances for many of these businesses, it's about their heart, their soul, their family businesses, their contribution that they are making to local communities. For these businesses, all they're looking for is a little bit of help. A little bit of light at the end of the tunnel, not just warm words and nice warm platitudes. Tomorrow, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance will stand up in this chamber and set out the Scottish Government budget for the next year. I hope that it will include some of the measures that I have mentioned. I hope that it will provide funding and support for our small businesses. I hope it will provide that little bit of reassurance that our businesses are looking for in the future. I hope it will provide for the great work. And I, I, completely agree with the Minister here, for our, for our business improvement districts. And I hope, President Officer, it will give more funding to local government so we can actually get on with the business of supporting our high streets. Warm words are great, but we want action. I submit the amendment in my name. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Lumsden. I would encourage um, the debate to continue with the making and taking of interventions as has just been demonstrated. And I call on Colin Smith to speak to and move amendment 2442.1 for around six minutes, Mr Smith. Thank you, President Officer. It's a, it's a privilege to, to represent the, the south of Scotland. We don't have any cities yet, uh, but it does have many unique, proud, diverse towns uh, and places. Uh, and prior to being an MSP, I also had the privilege of, of being a councillor uh, in Dumfries and Galloway, representing the Dumfries Town Centre Ward of Nith for a decade. At the time I was elected in 2007, a major developer was on the cusp of building a new shopping centre in the town with Debenhams as the anchor. To support the project, the Council bought a shop in the High Street on land that would be the entrance to that planned centre. Then the global economic crisis landed, the recession began, the high streets were hit hard and the developers' plans were dropped. And since then, there have been a number of initiatives from the Council to support town and village centres. I'm pleased to have proposed a number, including a town centre housing fund and various public realm improvements. Those interventions were an attempt to make our towns that bit more attractive. To, to recognise that after 40 years of retail growth, which was increasingly on greenfield out of town sites, and after 20 years of, of the growth of internet shopping, which now makes up over a third of retail sales in the UK, consumer behaviour had changed, with convenience and price often the main driver in our increasingly busy lifestyles. Consumers were no longer prepared to change their lifestyle to visit the high street shops as often as they maybe once did. They wanted a retail offer that suited their new lifestyle. There was a need to try to, to reimagine our town centres, to, to celebrate their history and identity, to give people new reasons to come into and indeed live in our town centres again, to then support the smaller retail sector that remained. And there are wonderful examples of developing that sense of place that do work across the region, the Wigtown Boot Town, uh, the, the Castle Douglas Food Town, the Kakubri Artist Town, most recently Moffat Dark Skies Town, I'm tempted to say Dumfries, the, the, the football town, but maybe after the last few weeks, possibly not. However, however, those efforts are increasingly being swamped by the sheer weight of the economic and social tsunami our retailers are facing, which has been exasperated by the pandemic, but by no means was caused by it. There has been an acceleration in shop closures, yet the cost base in our towns remains far too high and simply can't compete with out-of-town locations and online shopping. Many of the landlords who can often be absentee pension funds, and I remember phoning one landlord to complain about the trees growing through the windows of the property, and that pension fund, fund denied they even owned the building, and the reality is they probably didn't even know they did. And they, those companies, often absentee, are seeking rent levels from a bygone age, and they really are divorced from the current reality. So, President Officer, we need to, to cut costs and raise footfall for those who do want to do business in our towns. That is why in Labour's amendment today we set out two measures we have asked the Government to consider as part of their budget. Firstly, we want to see at least 50 per cent rates relief for retail, hospitality and leisure properties, similar to the level 
offered to businesses in England in the new financial year to ensure Scotland's businesses are not put at an economic disadvantage. Secondly, we need an immediate fiscal stimulus to encourage people safely back into our town centre shops. The Spend Local Vulture Scheme in Northern Ireland is a, is a great example of how we can inject cash directly into our local shops. The scheme was delivered by the Department for the Economy and offered all those aged over 18 in Northern Ireland a £100 voucher to spend in local businesses until the 14th of December. Data from the Northern Ireland Retail Consortium has shown that in November the number of shoppers increased to its highest level since before the pandemic and was down just 5.2% on 2019 compared to the rest of the UK, which saw a fall of between 16 and 20%. Retail Northern Ireland Chief Executive Glenn Roberts told the Belfast Telegraph that the scheme had been a, quote, an invaluable short-term boost for thousands of local independent retailers. And that's exactly the type of boost we need from the Scottish Government. So that's why Scottish Labour proposing an ambitious fiscal stimulus package to aid economic recovery, which includes a £50 voucher for every adult to spend in bricks and mortar retail. But it's also, President Officer, about long-term solutions. At the start of my comments, I mentioned a property in Dumfries High Street that would have been the entrance to a shopping centre that never happened and, frankly, never will. But that property was community transferred by the Council to a new community benefit company, the Mid Steeple Quarter, kick-starting their work to literally take back the high street shop by shop. They are now investing in that property and the others they have acquired to deliver the mix of uses our town needs – quality retail space that is affordable to local businesses, community space and, crucially, new housing. Its cooperative principle recognises that local people have the innovative solutions for their town and should have a local stake in its future through community ownership. Now, that really is Love Local. And I would commend the mid Steeple project to the Minister and invite him to visit to find out himself the difference they are making. More importantly, I would urge the Government to ensure that, at the heart of its policies on town centre, it is investing to support that bottom-up, community-led approach to regeneration, recognising in particular that developing housing in town centres does come with additional costs and needs to be supported. President officer, I uh, certainly will, yeah, if I have got time. Yeah. Emma Harper. Thank you. I thank Colin Smith for taking a quick intervention. He talks about the mid Steeple quarter and about putting housing back in the town centres. Would you agree that maybe some of that housing could be used to be passive housing, which actually will help tackle fuel poverty as well? Colin Smith. That is a very good point by, by Emma Harper. And I think one of the issues is that that, that, that type of housing, uh, even housing in the town centre, does cost more. It is easy for a social landlord to, to build a, a square box on a greenfield site. It is more expensive to do it on a brownfield site in our town centres. And that needs to be reflected when it comes to funding from government to social landlords and others to, to really focus on, on passive housing uh, and other uh, uh, I think quality accommodation in our town centres. There is little I disagree with in the Government's motion. 20-minute neighbourhoods and 10 per cent of transport funding for active travel are Labour manifesto commitments, although I am disappointed maybe public transport has not uh, merited a mention. But one point I would make around active travel, I hope lessons are learned from the Spaces for People initiative that, that whilst in many cases created welcome safe spaces, it also saw a majority of investment concentrated in just two cities. It actually took funding away from permanent active travel infrastructure uh, for, for pop-up initiatives. And in some cases, those temporary projects did alienate communities, I think undermining, in some cases, active travel. There is also no recognition uh, in the motion that in rural areas or market towns do serve communities often more than 20 minutes away, uh, and car use is, is not a luxury but a necessity. So we need to be careful not to make our town centres inaccessible for shop deliveries and customer parking too expensive, or it will simply accelerate those consumer trends that I did outline earlier around out-of-town shopping and online shopping. But my main criticism of the Government's motion is that, that the Love Local campaign, very well-meaning as it is in, in supporting a lot of really positive local initiatives, does not go far enough. I think we are often in danger of debating the merits of, of a sticky plaster, when the reality is, at the mo moment, our patient needs major surgery. So I am happy to move Labour's amendment in my name that I think strengthens and supports the Government's motion. It goes further than the, the Tory amendment in the, the level of support, and it recognises the urgency of the crisis our town centres face by proposing an urgent and immediate response. We need to seize this opportunity. We need to be ambitious. And if we are, we can deliver a real recovery for Scotland's towns. 
Thank you, Mr. Smith. Um, while encouraging um, interventions, could I also gently remind uh, the Chamber to make their interventions and responses through the Chair? Uh, with that, we move to the open debate, and I call first uh, Fiona Hislop to be followed by Finlay Carson. Around four minutes, Ms. Hislop. Uh, Presiding officer, local businesses are the economic beating heart of our communities, and of course, their contribution provides opportunity for regeneration, resilience, and development. Our town centre also offers us a sense of culture and place, and we are rightly proud to support them through initiatives such as Scotland Loves Local, particularly when we look at what our town centres have experienced over the last uh, most challenging 20 months. Local resilience and sustainability was always valued, but now it must be a premium. The Scottish Government uh, Love Local initiative highlights the importance of choosing local and promoting community wealth. But community wealth isn't just measured in cash numbers. A thriving town centre depends on its people. People provide drive, spirit and passion, and often it is our local business people who lead this. In my hometown of Linlithgow, which the Minister visited this summer, uh, the two business improvement districts came together with the Linlithgow Community Development Trust in October 2019 to create One Linlithgow, the first such bid in Scotland, which brings together local businesses of all sizes and the community groups that help them to thrive and survive. And with the Scottish Government's Business Resilience Funding, One Linlithgow were able to offer a tailored response to local businesses, offering face masks or distancing posters to some assisting with advice of how to continue trading safely. And with the help of volunteers, they organised a grand reopening hampers and provided and offered assistance to businesses uh, on what government support they were entitled to. One Lynn Lithgow also used the resilience funding uh, to establish digital markets, which made more than £7,000 for local businesses in their first 10 days of going live. Now, the uniqueness of this collaborative approach, which was hailed by the Minister on his visit, is one that is rooted in community support and resilience. Now, with the addition of Scotland Love's local fund, uh, local organisations and businesses are continuing to work collaboratively, providing an outdoor market and developing their informative uh, website, Mile and Lithgow. In other parts of my constituency, Green Action Trust in Broxburn and the Broxburn and Uphall Development Group both received £20,000 and £8,000 uh, respectively. Uh, they plan to create a community green space promoting physical and mental health. And the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs visited Scotland in Broxburn in my constituency, it's a popular place, uh, with the Scottish Grocer Federation only yesterday to promote the Scottish Government's Go Local programme, which drives sales of local food with 40% of sales increase and close to £1 million in additional Scottish food sales in just the first 10 stores. In Bathgate, where I started my Christmas shopping at the weekend on Small Business Saturday, at Choose Bathgate is very active. Their Facebook pages are filled with businesses, for example, the Phoenix Health and Wellbeing Centre and uh, championing other businesses, uh, encouraging shoppers to explore um, the high street. Scotland Loves Local and the Gift Card Scheme, I would say this to Colin Smith, in my view, um, should also be able to tackle inequality. Giving free money to all, as been the approach of Northern Ireland, for example, uh, is one way of doing things. But in Scotland, my preference would be for councils or indeed, as I think we heard, citizen advice to provide funded gift uh, cards to the most vulnerable in our community. So therefore targeting poverty at the same time as supporting local businesses. So I hope Colin Smith can maybe consider that approach. Our town centres show others who we are, where we've been and have the power to shape where we want to go. By supporting Love Local, we are not just investing in the local economy, we, invest, we are investing in our people, local innovation and creativity, our culture and our sense of place. And an important lesson is that the ideas uh, will come from local businesses, not necessarily uh, what can be seen as remote councils or indeed remote government. And that's a strong lesson we should learn. Our local uh, businesses, uh, President Officer, suffered under lockdown because they closed to keep us safe. We must now, in turn, keep them safe. We must ensure they thrive, and we must do this by coming together as a community and continuing to shop local and support Scotland Loves Local.
Thank you very much, Mr. Slot. I now call Finlay Carson to be followed by Jim Fairley. Again, four minutes, Mr. Carson. Thank you, Deputy President. Officer, for many, COVID-19 has dramatically changed how we shop, particularly for food during the lockdown. And currently, with the right support, it looks like that welcome trend may continue. In the main, people shopped less frequently, but more locally. And the shift to buying local was partly down to necessity. However, as many larger supermarket chains closed their doors to new online orders because of manpower restrictions, our local businesses really stepped up to the mark and went above and beyond to open their doors. In many cases, like the example of Rhone Dairies in my constituency, increased deliveries of milk to those self-isolating, which was a, literally a lifeline service, and hopefully now, thankfully, set to great benefit greatly in the months and the coming years ahead. A recent survey revealed that 84% of people now want to buy more local food and drink than they did previously. It's a welcome news uh, for, for anybody, uh, particularly our family businesses across the country. And this trend has been highlighted in a recent survey carried out in Dumfries and Galloway that found growing numbers now intended to buy directly from producers and retailers within their communities, which again is great news for many on our local high streets, which have seen their businesses suffer badly from the pandemic and uh, online trading. However, given some of the comments from the speakers today, it's apparent that greater support uh, is needed uh, to our, strug our struggling high streets, and hopefully that will come forward in the budget tomorrow. Food and drink in Dumfries and Galloway is now the largest, fastest growing and most valuable economic sector. It's worth £1.2 billion and crucially employs more than 9,000 people. And I can point out this figure doesn't include local butchers, bakers and farm shops. The, the food and drink sector is the engine of our region's economy and everything possible must be done to ensure that it continues. It needs more than just nice slogans and good intentions. Meaningful support must be given to improve local infrastructure, a problem that is particularly acute in my constituency, where despite having one of the biggest beef and lamb producing areas in Scotland, it has limited processing capacity and no abattoir. It means local authorities supporting local producers and participating in public procurement, not using centralised procurement for marginal price per unit gains that benefits no one. And crucially, it only works against producers like Galloway dairy farmers, which are, are right in the middle of the, the milk fields of Scotland. Local food and drink producers must be supported in ambitions, ambitions by a boots-on-the-ground approach and not with a one-size-fits-all growth pathway that regularly misunderstands the drivers of rural enterprise. Local groups are best placed by recognising and supporting... Div Certainly. Jim Fairley. Uh, I'd just like to ask uh, Mr Carson, would he accept and give credit to the fact that the, Scotland, uh, the, the fastest growing sector in Scotland is actually the food and drink sector, uh, with ambition 2030 to double its value between now and 2030? Um, would you not accept that this, that would not have happened without the intervention of the SNP government when Richard Lochie took on as um, set up the first national food and drink policy for Scotland? Finley Cost. I, I absolutely accept Scotland's going uh, further and, and th than uh, we must, many had, had thought, but I'm, I'm not going to thank Richard Lockhead for anything when he did what he did as, as, as Agriculture Minister, uh, given a lot of the failures uh, he did. However. Um, we must realise that diversity in business is something to celebrate, and that diversity of breed, of approach and of business model is what creates resilience, especially in rural communities like Dumfries uh, and Galloway. There must be an honest investment in local organisations and local enablers who understand how to make things work. It's important that we recognise examples of good practice where, against all the odds, small organisations and small producers are doing some outstanding work like the supply chain development work done by the Galloway Cattle Society, which has turned this at-risk native breed around and is now working directly with supermarket giants Aldi. Indeed, there is every chance that Galloway beef will be on the menu in many households this Christmas. I would also like to praise the collaborative approach taken by Dumfries and Galloway Farmers and Community Market Association, a network of about a dozen community markets that creates trading opportunities for more than 70 local businesses, sharing knowledge, equipment and expertise that ultimately makes local food and drink accessible to rural people. Galloway quite justifies its reputation of a land of high quality primary production and of food manufacturing knowledge and expertise, yet it is also sadly a sector of undeveloped potential. But we can all uh, ask for change and encourage and support uh, that change, leading to greater, 
greater job growth and creation across the region. More thought must be given to ensuring key procurement contracts for hospitals and council services are awarded to local businesses. The COVID pandemic has absolutely proven that shorter supply chains are more resilient and more sustainable supply chains. The Scottish Government must do more to work in tandem with farmers, growers, processors, wholesalers, distributors and re retailers to lessen our need for food imports and grow and promote our UK and Scottish food and drink industry. Presiding officer, more young people should and be nurtured to consider moving into agriculture and the fishing sectors uh, in the near future if we are to prosper and grow. Unlocking this normal potential means growing and seizing emerging markets and opportunities. With businesses... You need to close now, Mr Costner. I Carson. certainly will. Uh, we've got some fantastic businesses I would love to have mentioned in Dumfries and Galloway. But we've, let's uh, look at a shorter, more resilient, fairer supply chain that COVID has presented to us. And sure, we don't let it go. Thank you, Mr Carson. You can write to those businesses, I'm sure. Uh, Jim Fairley, uh, to be followed by Claire Baker, around four minutes, Mr Fairley. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, I warmly welcome today's motion. It is all about government providing big picture thinking and local communities filling in the details according to their indiv individual needs and situations. And that is exactly how it should be. And that's how we get community led regeneration. Like many of my colleagues, I made a point on Saturday going out to visit a range of local businesses uh, in and around my constituency to highlight Small Business Saturday. There's an incredible range of fantastic small businesses right across Persia, South and Kinrosia, and I could start to list them all, presiding officer, but I don't think you're going to give me the length of time that I would need to do so. And as we all know, brevity is not my strong point at the best of times. Small businesses really are a vital part of our communities, and they absolutely deserve our support. And that support has probably never been more needed than now, with the COVID-19 pandemic having had such a big impact impact, particularly on the retail and hospitality sectors. Online shopping and large chains might offer convenience, but the independent retailers right on your own doorstep offer that as well. And as well as much more, individuality, craftsmanship and personal services are only some of the benefits you can expect from shopping with good local businesses. A well-known butcher in Perth City Centre, Beaton Lindsay from Lindsay Butchers and Sons, is one of those folk who just quite simply is part of the community. He knows his customers by name and often knows what they want before they even say a word. And Boris Johnson once crowed that a pound spent in Croydon is far more value to the country than a pound spent in Strathclyde. He was wrong, of course, as he always is. But let's rewrite that phrase. A pound spent in Creef will do far more good for the local economy if it stays in Strathern. And you can swap Creef for Kinross or Medvin or Ochterader. The principle remains the same. And I'm delighted to admit to the, men the minister mentioned our new radio... Uh, local radio station, Radio Earn, so thank you very much for that, Minister. That's what is meant by phrases like circular economies and sustainable communities, and that is absolutely what Scotland Loves Local has to be all about. Encouraging and enabling local people to spend their money in local businesses, and by giving those businesses access to the technologies that will help them compete with the corporate giants and creating environments that will help increase footfall and activity, so building local wealth. When it comes to David versus Goliath, let's always try to be sure that we get right behind David. The Scottish Government has launched the £10 million multi-year Scotland Loves Local Fund to support local people, businesses and community partnerships. £2 million being made available, made available this year, supporting up to 100 organisations to bring new creative projects and activities to towns and neighbourhoods. In my own constituency, that fund will help to support the Murray Fountain, an iconic local Victorian landmark in James Square in Creef. And it will help the launch of a delivery of the multi-channel multi Christmas campaign across Perth and Kinross, Perth, where Christmas is made. This is a campaign that includes Perth City and Town's gift guide and a promotion of the Scotland Loves Local gift card to support and encourage and incentivise shopping local, locally. But it's not all about shopping. Scotland Loves Local agenda is also about tackling inequality and promoting community-led regeneration. Reticent as I am to see any silver line in the dark cloud of COVID, something that has come shining through has been absolutely wonderful in the way that communities in my constituency, as they have across the country, have come together to help those in need of support and to help one another. Through the toughest part... Absolutely. Finley Carson. Thank you. I appreciate uh, uh, the member taking intervention. Would you agree, though, that uh, a one-size-fits-all growth plan doesn't always address the issues right down in a, a, a rural area and we should look to more government support going to local groups to deliver some of the ambitions, particularly in the food and drink industry. 
Jim Fairley. I don't have a lot of time, so all I'm going to say is that the government is doing exactly that, Finlay. I don't know where you've been sitting. Through the toughest part of lockdown, over 7,500 food, food parcels were delivered by 16 community organisations around Perth and Kinross. Community groups like Lethem for All, Broke Not Broken and Kinross were all just fantastic. And I am delighted, incidentally, to see the diggers have moved in this week to start the transformation of the Lethem Recreation Centre in a new community hub run for and by local people. I said earlier that I wasn't going to start listing local businesses, but I do want to highlight one great wee company that deserves our support right now. And I would refer this to Mr Lumsden. Michelle Maritz is a driving force behind Clutie McToot, and I have known her for a very long time. When I ran events before I came into this place, I was, if I was looking for great quality local producers, Michelle was always one of the first names on my list. She began her business with a stall at a school fete, and she moved on to farmer's markets, and she now is a shop in Abernethy, a mail-order business selling traditional Clutie dumplings. So I was absolutely disgusted to learn that she's been subjected to simply appalling levels of online abuse by ill-advised morons. And if that's not Parliament to use word, such a word, uh, President Officer, um, I still think we need to call Mr. out Fairley, that kind of moronic behaviour. If you could close now, please. Thank you. Yep. Uh, she, she was given this abuse for promoting her business, as I would have done myself in her shoes, at a festive food and drink market in Downing Street. I would urge you all to go and order your uh, Christmas pudding from Clutie McToot in solidarity, but I'm pleased to say you can't. Her order book is now full, although I do understand you can still pick up a Christmas gift or two from her shop in Abernethy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Fairley. I call Claire Baker to be followed by Eleanor Whittam. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I welcome this afternoon's debate. And while it is framed by the Scotland Loves Local campaign, which I think is a positive initiative, and I do hope it will increase activity in high streets and independent retailers, it is also an opportunity to discuss the pressures that are facing retailers and recognise their important role in supporting communities throughout the pandemic. Scotland Loves Local is a promotional campaign that is always important in retail, but it won't by itself change the trading environment for our high streets. That needs greater intervention and a recognition the pandemic has had a significant impact on the viability of many retailers in high streets. However, for some larger retailers, particularly supermarkets, the pandemic was a boost to their businesses and our business taxation system should recognise that. And government investment for recovery must now be focused in a fair way which supports employment skills and SMEs. Vibrant local high streets can retain resources and wealth in their local communities. And more than ever, we need to be supporting towns and providing resources to promote local high streets and businesses. And when we are thinking of ways to support local high streets, we should recognise the importance of collaborative working. In my region, Burnt Island and now Kinghorn both host the Fiverr Fest week or fortnight, which are popular and highlight independent businesses in the town as part of the Totally Locally campaign. And we also had Small Business Saturday on Saturday, and I was spoilt for choice in Burnt Island and who to choose, but I did go to Sunrise Bakehouse, who are a fairly new business who are thriving. I have seen Burnt Island High Street transform from a faded, tired High Street into one which regularly features in national newspapers and on television. So why is it so successful? A few factors to consider. It has cheaper business rates than larger towns. It has additional attractions in having a beach and a, summer, uh, a fair in the summer. Uh, we don't want to encourage car use, but it does have ample parking, a free parking, as well as a train station. It has grown as a town with new housing developments. It has anchor shops that draw in other businesses, and many of the businesses are run by people who have a strong commitment to the town. The traders work well together and they promote each other's business, and I hope it continues to grow and succeed. There is relevance here to the proposal for the 20-minute neighbourhoods. The Minister has described the fourth national planning framework as a driver for this. But the idea does need more substance and it will need investment. At the moment, it is a vision, but it needs a number of policies and interventions that will work together to make sure it can deliver. So Kirkcaldy is just a few miles up the coast from Burnt Island, and its fortunes are very different. It is facing challenges similar to many larger high streets across Scotland. I first want to recognise the businesses who are opening in the town and the high street, and many of them are independent real retailers rather than the large chains, and they are trying to change the offer on the high street. And also recognise the role of Fife Council and the efforts they are making to regenerise the town centre. 
However, the failure of some large retailers under significant pressure from the pandemic, from online competition, from the poor management and speculative practice of some owners does present huge challenges. Uh, large empty retail units, Kirkcaldy even has an empty shopping centre, requires investment, imagination, incentives and government intervention that will break the opaque ownership of buildings and support investment in local regeneration. And evidence from the retail sector at the Economy and Fair Work Committee last week, we heard of the importance of business rates relief for the sector during lockdown and restrictions. And our amendment does call for a continuation of these policies using consequential spending, which will also provide Scottish retailers with a level playing field to the rest of the UK. The Scottish Retail Consortium also talked about broader cost pressures, rising energy costs, inflation and staff shortages. If we value high street retail and if we recognise there are broader benefits, there is a need for intervention. And the co-op party, of which I am a member, have launched their Unlock the High Street campaign. They are calling for ownership transparency and new routes for community cooperative ownership, an issue that Colin Smith talked about, um, as well as how we reform taxation to make sure uh, business, small businesses aren't disadvantaged by uh, online sales. The Scotland Loves Local gift card is good, but it does lack incentives other than appealing to local businesses. It should at least have a financial top-up from government. As others have highlighted, Northern Ireland had the same uh, similar card. It had funds on it. People then spent that money in their town centres, and it was a kickstart for the retail and hospitality sector. Our amendment calls for a similar policy, and I hope this is something the Scottish Government will consider. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Baker. I call Eleanor Whittam to be followed by Ariane Burgess. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Before I start my speech, can I refer members to my register of interests? I'm a serving councillor on East Ayrshire Council, which is one of two council areas in my Carrick, Cumnock and Dune Valley constituency. Right at the crest of the first wave of the pandemic, councillors and officers in East Ayrshire recognised the real spirit being shown by our communities and local businesses. Working hand in glove with the local authority, everyone was collectively striving to keep folks safe and to ensure we all had access to necessities. Neighbours met for the first time in new community resilience groups came together with the support of the Council's vibrant communities team. These newly forged and strengthened relationships are now vital for ensuring we emerge from the pandemic in a way that promotes inclusive growth, local pro procurement and community wealth building, with a focus on community-led regeneration and sustainable 20-minute communities. Back in May 2020, while still Deputy Leader of East Ayrshire Council, I was proud to support the Council in its trailblazing endeavour to support the Kilmarnock and Cumnock Business Associations and the business communities right across East Ayrshire by introducing the East Ayrshire gift card, which has benefited retail by increasing footfall and boosting the local economy, helping businesses to adapt and respond to the pandemic. It works as a closed-loop credit card. The gift card is now accepted and sold in over 180 businesses throughout East Ayrshire. Its flexibility, allowing it to be bought and spent in person or online, helped keep businesses, local businesses trading throughout lockdown and enabled many traders to venture onto online trading for the first time at no cost to themselves, bringing them to the attention of new customers throughout the area. Whilst many of the businesses who registered um, were in the larger towns, the Council worked to ensure that businesses in more rural areas of the Authority were signed up to reduce the need for people to travel and spend the card. This embodies the concept of the 20-minute neighbourhood. The card can also be redeemed online and the team worked to introduce the Shop Appy platform and help retailers to make the move to digital retailing. Following on from East Ayrshire's UK leading approach to locally sourced school food, in December 2020, elected members identified an opportunity to help families who required support while also helping the business community who had been impacted by the pandemic and subsequent lockdowns. East Ayrshire gift cards to the value of £20 were included in the locally procured food boxes that were distributed at Christmas to primary school children who received free school meals. And this was on top of the much needed uh, £100 um, hardship payments from the Scottish Government. A total of 4,030 cards were distributed. The gift cards gave family flexibilities on how they managed their finances to best suit their own needs. And data revealed that they were used in a variety of ways, from Christmas dinners, including butcher meat, baked goods, arts and crafts activities, clothing, and even to make vehicles road safe. This was again repeated in Easter 2021, with the criteria extended to include nursery children, and the value of the card was increased from £50 to £50, and we funded that from council budgets. 4,520 gift cards were distributed, 
Like the Christmas campaign, data showed that the majority of people use these cards responsibly to the benefit of their family. Using the gift card in this way takes the stigma away from families who are in food poverty. Nobody, including the shopkeepers, knows whether they've received a gift card as a gift or part of a care package. It also supports the shop local principle and feeds into the community wealth building agenda. Gift cards must be redeemed locally. Any searcher to help keep that wealth locally. The first year of sales of the gift card was just over £330,000. And in addition to people purchasing the, them as gifts, businesses also started to purchase them to gift to their staff at Christmas time or to use as incentives. Finally, presiding officer, as the minister also mentioned, I was absolutely delighted to see the East Ayrshire recognised via the judges special award for their trailblazing work on the East Ayrshire gift card at the inaugural Scotland Loves Local Awards last week. What an achievement and I spend a send a special thanks to Town Centre Regeneration Officer Tracy Murray, herself a former boutique owner who spearheaded the creation of the card. Thanks to her drive and innovation, the Scottish Government and Scotland's Town Partnerships have taken her acorn of an idea and launched the Scotland Loves Local gift card nationwide. Colleagues, please keep your local gift card in mind this holiday season and support businesses at the heart of your communities. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Whittam. I call Ariane Burgess to be followed by Colin Beattie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I thank the Minister for his statement. Local is a topic that's close to my heart. During the first lockdown, I kick-started a mutual aid group in Murray, inspired by countless examples across Scotland of communities pulling together, taking an initiative and providing support by local people for local people. But despite this grand swell in community activity, most people feel cut off from local decision-making. The 2019 Scottish Household Survey found that only 18% of Scots believe they can influence decisions that impact on them and their local communities. And despite the growing movement to buy local and support local businesses, the supply chain and skilled workers are often not in place, particularly in remote, rural and island areas. A constituent in Inverness recently wrote to me after finding that there were zero companies providing internal wall insulation within a reasonable distance of his home. And just yesterday, in chamber, members raised concerns about the insufficient provision of local maternity care services in Murray. And I have spoken before about the centralization of air traffic control, moving skilled jobs from more remote areas from the highland, from, of the Highlands and Islands. To reverse this situation, we can start by strengthening local supply chains. To support the local farming and food sectors, a healthy portion of public sector catering should be locally sourced. The Good Food Nation Bill should instruct pub public bodies to include a local food procurement target in their Good Food Nation plans. In the housing sector, we must invest multi-year funding in skills development training and apprenticeships to expand and upskill the workforce that can deliver green homes, particularly in remote and island communities. And we must encourage house builders to use, green, to use wood grown sustainably in Scotland to support our rural forestry sector. We should support more remote businesses like Fula Wool, who are using a grant from the Island Communities Fund to shorten their supply chain by creating their own renewable energy powered spinning mill on their island, they will move jobs onto the island and increase their business resilience to climate and economic impacts. To build a net zero nation, we need to start local and bring everyone with us. That is why the Scottish Government and the Greens shared policy program promotes community wealth building and community led regeneration. Yes. Jimmy Halcrow Johnston. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the member for taking the intervention. Um, I think we all agree that um, active travel and also saving things like rural bus services are vital. But our high streets do, do need people, particularly in our more remote and rural communities, they do need people to be able to access them. So will she agree with me that those people who perhaps rely on the car because they're older, they're isolated, they live in remote communities, do need still parking in high streets to be able to access them? Ariane Burgess. Thank you. I think absolutely people who uh, need to use cars uh, should have cars and I think there are good measures where certainly in my town we have very good measures for community parking spaces where they can put their cars. However, I'm going to continue with what I was saying. Uh, 
The wants and needs of communities are too often overruled under our current planning system when developers are given the go-ahead for projects that conflict with local plans, which communities have worked hard to shape. Some communities are even compelled to dig into their own pockets to take such cases to court, such as the recent case of Karmundak Community Council defending locally important green belt land against luxury homes development approved by Glasgow City Council. It shouldn't be this difficult for communities to influence what happens in their local area. I will push for the National Planning Framework 4 to include a presumption against development that departs from local development plans. Further, I will work with my colleagues in government to grant land assembly powers to public bodies to Please enable them up, to Ms. develop Burgess. the land that is wanted by communities, not by profit-seeking developers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Burgess. I call Colin Beattie to be followed by Maurice Golden. Presiding officer, I, I very much welcome and support the Scotland Loves Local campaign. There are so many reasons why we should all endeavour to purchase our needs from local businesses and to support our local community projects. As never before, we've relied on our local businesses and communities to see us through the pandemic, especially during lockdown. Notably, we all encountered global supply issues, and most often this was in respect to the supply of foodstuffs, many of which may be readily available locally. Today, we all see the shortages in the supermarkets caused mainly by Brexit, compounded by COVID. By buying from local suppliers, we will encourage the expansion of the local supply chain, and this will create more resilience in the supply of our foodstuffs and reduce the pressure on longer and currently stretched supply chains. As local demand rises, so we will see the expansion of local production. In turn, this will create more jobs and generate more local in income, thus raising prosperity and creating sustainable new businesses and long-term economic growth. One of the most obvious reasons, of course, for helping support our local businesses is to ensure that more money, quite simply, stays in the local economy. This helps everyone locally become wealthier and makes our local businesses more resilient. The result has been smaller businesses which have the potential to expand and develop into bigger businesses, which can cater for more people locally than they could before. And it's important we nurture this and invest to retain these services. Now, I'm not expecting each community to start building TV sets or to set up a motor, motor car assembly plant, but there's many products that could be made locally and which do not require expensive infrastructure or huge capital investment. Local councils must play a key part in driving this forward by encouraging and supporting the construction of local supply chains. It will benefit them and it will benefit us all. I have seen firsthand in my own constituency, and I am sure other MSPs have witnessed the same in theirs, the way that our communities pulled together in their resilience efforts during the pandemic, with their extraordinary work leaving a lasting impact on so many. This campaign not only recognises how much we rely on our local communities, but helps our communities continue this vital work through investment. I was pleased to see within my constituency of Midlothian North and Musselburgh the investment put into supporting local community projects, businesses and social enterprises. For example, Wondal Keith recently received £20,000 as part of this year's £1.5 million funding boost from the Scotland Loves Local Fund. I know that this fund will really benefit Wondal Keith to achieve their primary goal to connect and support local businesses, including freelancers and home-based businesses, by providing a central networking hub in the heart of the town. However, this fund has also helped projects in my constituency tackle one of the worst parts of the COVID-19 pandemic, isolation. Both Wellbeing Essential in Roslyn and Midlothian Cyrenians, located in the Midlothian Community Hospital in Bonnerig, received £17,500 a great investment to two very deserving projects, providing safe outdoor spaces for those who need to escape from today's mass digital culture, those who found themselves unemployed or suffering from poor mental health. Having these resources readily available in our communities to give a helping hand when most needed is crucial. It's that point exactly we must bear in mind, having the resources readily available in a post-Brexit and post-pandemic Scotland. I want to see our communities delivering the most sought-after services, and I want to see these services remain within the community. By doing so, we not only help our communities prosper, 
but create the ideal of the 20-minute neighbourhoods we seek to achieve. We have learned from the pandemic that our surroundings can make a huge impact on our health and well-being. It has also made us reflect on our community surroundings and the importance of the need to protect and preserve those surroundings. By supporting Love Local, you also support our need to protect our communities from climate change. By reducing the need for goods to be flown or trucked in from elsewhere, we are reducing the carbon footprint and contributing, contributing to a more sustainable future for jobs and our economy. This aspect should not be downplayed. The significant, a significant impact can be made if we buy local on a wide scale, and every initiative to do so helps. We can all play our part in that. I would ask that we all continue to think local, to choose local and shop local. And I very much look forward to seeing how this campaign grows with the future investment promised by the Scottish Government, fulfilling an ambition which we can all share. Thank you. Thank you. I call Maurice Golden to be followed by Paul O'Kane. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The pandemic hit our economy like a truck, and our world-class food and drink industry has taken a heavy hit, whether producers, retailers or hospitality venues. So today I will focus my remarks on them. Ogilvy Spirits in Glam's, producer of Scotland's first potato vodka. Angus Soft Fruits, working alongside UK and international growers to ensure a year-round supply chain. PJ Sterling of Arbroath, M&S said they couldn't source any better strawberries in the world. And I can't mention Arbroath without recognising the famous Arbroath Smoky, supplied by renowned local fishmongers such as Spinks and Swankies. Or that other famous Angus delicacy, the Forfer Bridie, that is a mainstay of so many local high street bakeries. I could go on, but the point is clear. Scotland has world-beating food and drink businesses that are worth protecting. And the Scottish Conservatives have a plan to do that. Let me explain. We want to see food and drink firms flourish on the high street so we would relax planning laws and delay new regulations until 2023. And the more people visiting hospitality venues, the more people there are to support retailers. We would encourage customers to buy more local produce from those retailers and we would ensure public procurement always favoured Scottish produce, a Scotland-first approach. For producers, we would launch a comprehensive farm-to-fork review of food policy as a central part of our economic recovery. That would mean increasing producers' bargaining power. Yes, happy to. Eleanor Whittam. Thank you for taking the intervention. I wonder if, if Maurice Golden understands that at the moment councils can actually make those decisions as it stands in terms of procuring locally. East Ayrshire procures a huge amount of its food and, and other goods locally already. That can actually happen right now. Maurice Golden. I think most people would recognise that public procurement uh, being sustainable has been failing us for a number of years. And in fact, the Public Procurement Act uh, didn't deliver what it should have done and too often local suppliers are being left out of public procurement and that needs to change. It's a shame the member doesn't agree with that. Therefore, all these actions would help to strengthen our food systems. The pandemic showed how resilient they are, but we can't just rely, continue to rely on just-in-time supply chains. In all, our plan could double the size of Scotland's food and drink sector by the end of the decade. The British government has already started work. The UK budget provided £1.9 billion for Scottish farmers and to guarantee them extra funding for the next three years. The British government has also delivered a freeze in US whisky tariffs, a huge win for our food and drink exports. Establishing a network of Scottish trade hubs across the rest of the UK would deliver another boost. Yes, happy to. I'm Jim confused. Curley, briefly. Thank you, President Officer. I'm, I'm confused at the, the farm to fork um, uh, ideals that you're spouting here when the UK government are making trade deals with agri producers all over the world to bring cheaper products into Scotland. Maurice Golden. I, I'm not surprised the member is confused. He's a, a, a general uh, uh, demeanour is of that ilk. So let me be clear. Action is needed. Shop vacancies are at a six-year high. Retailers speak of 
insurmountable challenges, and over a dozen industry bodies have written to the Finance Secretary for help. We hear that call and we want to see a full year of 75 per cent rates relief. We forced the SNP to deliver rates relief last year and we want food retailers and hospitality venues protected again. So let's everyone buy, eat and promote local every chance we get. Thank you. I call Paul O'Kane to be followed by Emma Roddick. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I welcome this debate and the opportunity uh, to firstly pay tribute to all of our local businesses who have lived through an unimaginable 20 months. Uh, on Small Business Saturday last weekend, I was pleased, like many members, to pop into the excellent local businesses in the community where I live. Uh, the Pad Restaurant in Nielsen, for example, who have managed to keep going, I am very glad to say, through the support of local people using their new takeaway service during lockdown and coming back into the restaurant when it was safe to do so. And despite being caught up in the many challenges of changing restrictions, including uh, that quite frankly ridiculous debate about the definition of a cafe, uh, Lindsay and Linda, who run uh, the pad, have told me about how much they have valued the support of local people. Um, despite all of the challenges, along with many other local businesses, uh, they have also sought to give something back throughout the pandemic, including preparing afternoon tea boxes for older people and those shielding. And that's just one example of the many generous acts uh, carried out by local small businesses in the pandemic. Many also offered free meals for key workers, discounts and preferential shopping times. So there is great resilience on our high streets and a sense of wanting to come together. But I do worry sincerely about the ability of businesses to survive and thrive. And it is clear that we owe them real and meaningful support in order to navigate what continues to be an extremely difficult set of circumstances. Because we know that Scotland has lost almost 20,000 small businesses during a single year of the COVID crisis. And too many businesses have just found it too difficult to remain open. And we have seen, quite frankly, the hopes and dreams of many small and medium business owners completely shattered. And I'm sure that members across this chamber will agree that our local businesses are at the heart of what keeps our communities full of life. And we've heard, I think, excellent examples of that from around the chamber this afternoon. Indeed, the minister and I uh, hail from the same part of the world. Uh, and I have seen him tweet his childhood memories of Friday nights with the Alpino Chippy, a film from Fox Bar Video and a tub of Central Cafe ice cream. And I have similar memories, so allow me to put on record for the first time my endorsement of Central Cafe ice cream in this chamber, although uh, possibly too much of that was consumed uh, during lockdown. Uh, in all seriousness, I know that the Minister understands the importance of these businesses to towns like Barhead. Uh, and that's why it is so vitally important that we do more uh, and that we go further. And, and as colleagues have said, you know, I think the, the kind of principles of Scotland Loves Local are um, indeed uh, very worthy uh, and, and very good. And, and, and I will declare an interest, of course, as a councillor in East Renfrewshire. And I know that the council have benefited from many of those initiatives, uh, which, uh, which I know the minister has seen for himself as well. But, as I have said, I do think we need to go further and we need to consider what else we can do uh, and look at, for example, that voucher scheme and whether it would be better, uh, as Colin Smith and others have uh, said, to look at the Northern Irish uh, method, to put actual spending power into people's pockets uh, into our town centres. And I do hope that the Minister... Certainly. Fiona Hislop. Uh, the member will have listened to Elena Whittam and the idea of using the gift card in a targeted way for those that need it, financial help rather than have a blanket approach that Northern Ireland has. So does he welcome the pilot of the citizen advice uh, distribution that m the minister mentioned in his opening speech? Briefly, Mr O'Keefe. Uh, certainly. I mean, I, of course I would welcome that. That is happening in our community uh, in East Renfrewshire as well. However, what I'm trying to say here and the point I'm trying to make is that we need to listen to all of these ideas. We need to put money in to everyone's pockets so that they can spend it in communities. I think that is vitally important so that people are going into town centres and are spending more money. So I do hope that the Minister will listen to what we are suggesting because we do it in a spirit of collaboration and indeed consensus. And I think very worthily as well, uh, we mentioned the 50% business rates which I think will give business, uh, businesses the breathing room they require to survive as we go into uh, next year. And indeed, um, as I have already mentioned, I think that that voucher uh, that we are proposing in terms of £50 for every adult aged 60 and over to spend in non-grocery businesses with physical premises in Scotland will give businesses the boost that they need to thrive. Because I have said, presiding officer, 
These are our communities. They are important to all of us. They are important to our constituents. And we need to help these businesses to be at the heart of them. Thank you. Thank you. And before I call Emma Roddick, the last speaker in the open debate, can I remind members that they should stay in the chamber for at least two speakers following them? And of course, those who have taken part in any debate should be in for closing speeches. Emma Roddick. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I was absolutely delighted to be welcoming funding for various parts of the Highlands and Islands, including over 17 grand for projects in Orkney, 10,000 each for Nern and Shetland, and 20,000 for Inverness and the surrounding area, and the list goes on. Extra funding to bids in Nern, Kirkwall and Inverness could go a long way, as will more money for Shetland Food and Drink and Living Lerick, who I'm sure will use to champion the, at the moment, criminally underappreciated local produce, some of, such as that that's offered by the island larder, which I enjoy immensely when I visit the Isles. This is what good governance looks like. It is funding at a local level which has purpose, principles and policies to back it up. Investing in local places cannot just stop at giving funding for projects, so it is disappointing to me that the Tory amendment today seeks to remove nods to wider actions, such as safe spaces for walking, wheeling and cycling, at the end of the motion. We are past the point of talking about these things in isolation. If we want people to return to high street shopping, those high streets have to be accessible and they have to be nice places to spend time. If we are going to tackle climate change, infrastructure for people, for bikes and for public transport has to be front and centre. If we leave town centres as polluted, unattractive spaces for cars to use as rat runs, then there is nothing to encourage people off their sofas and off the internet and onto our pavements and into local shops. I do actually agree with the line in the Tories' amendment that, that things weren't really working pre-pandemic. I just don't agree with the conclusion that they draw that the solution is to focus solely on throwing money at the issue without addressing the causes of low footfall. No amount of rates relief or eat out to help out-esque vouchers will be enough to tide high street businesses over if there is nobody coming through the doors. What we had before wasn't great. The pandemic, for all the bad it's brought us and all that we've lost. Certainly. Douglas I, I thank the member for giving way. And um, I think what we were trying to say is that you know, there has been problems for a long time before the pandemic. And I, I agree with the member on that fact. And it's just that you know, we've had an SNP government for so, for so long, and this, that hasn't been addressed for a long period of time. Emma Roddick. We've had an SNP government for a long time. We've also had a UK government for a long time, which has refused to give the Scottish government fiscal powers to make the change that you're asking for today. <laughs> Financial support for business is vital, and it is being delivered by the SNP government, as we have heard today. And that is being delivered despite ongoing restrictions on economic decisions that we can make in this place without the permission of Westminster. However, our businesses should be thriving, not just relying on short-term funding or other financial support. Pontification and demands made by the opposition might make better headlines than the Scottish Government's approach, which takes into consideration transport, spaces, climate change, housing and so many other policies which have an effect on the experience of business owners in this country. But those headlines aren't going to help anyone but them. This rounded, thoughtful approach is... Certainly. Paul O'Kane, and can I remind the member... And the members in her last minute. Thank you. I, I thank uh, Emma Ruddy for taking the intervention. She speaks about headlines uh, and these being headline things. Uh, does she accept that you know, Northern Ireland has had an experience with the voucher scheme which has worked exceptionally well and has been uh, supported by Chambers of Commerce? Emma Roddick, briefly. I'm sure that the member won't disagree with me that my point was that's not good enough on its own. We have to consider the wider picture, which is what this motion does. Presiding officer, I want to finish today by saying that this week I encouraged my constituents to respond to the consultation on the National Planning Framework 4. And I want to repeat that call today. Too often we don't feed into local development plans or national frameworks. We wait until a planning application that we absolutely hate comes in and then say, hold on a minute. And that's too late. So please get involved now. Tell us what your priorities are and share your thoughts on how we create better places. Thank you. We now move to closing speeches, and I call on Paul Sweeney. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's been a real pleasure to um, listen to the speakers in this debate today, and it's certainly been a really insightful experience 
Um, the common theme that came out, I think, today was the sheer impact that, that the pandemic has had on the resilience of local high streets and small local businesses. Uh, as my colleague Paul came from West Scotland, highlighted 20,000 small businesses across Scotland shutting up shop throughout the pandemic, a figure that the Federation of Small Business has described as catastrophic, and I think we can all agree with that. So the question now is, how does this Parliament respond to this crisis in, in our midst? Um, I think the broad observations today has been a big shift from local business to global multinationals. And that is a trend that we really need to seriously address. And I think whilst we commend the uh, motion in the government's name today, um, it doesn't go far enough to address the sheer scale of the problem that the country now faces. Our towns and businesses, uh, in many cases, these businesses are the source of middle class prosperity. They drive local employment, ensure accessibility and create that local economy and that ecosystem that truly benefits local wealth creation. Unfortunately, they are suffering and this parliament needs to step up. I think extending 50% rates relief um, would be a very um, welcome and immediate measure and I would urge the Finance Secretary to give that serious consideration in the budget tomorrow. But we also need a fundamental review of business rates as an efficient tax system. I think alternative options such as revenue profit sharing, land value taxation have to be seriously explored by this parliament uh, and we need to give that full consideration. But our primary focus surely must be on what we can do to maximise high street occupancy. Too much focus is often on how we maintain value of property and rental rates at the expense of occupancy and we've seen that blight our high streets for too long. As colleagues like Claire Baker from, uh, from Mid Scotland Faith referring to Burnt Island as a great model, um, Ms Burgess from uh, Highlands Islands region referring to how we can actually address the ownership of real estate in our country is a major issue. Expanding community and municipal ownership, using existing models such as the Housing Association model, using that capacity to buy up more of our commercial real estate assets within town centres could be a way of driving that wealth back into communities because ownership of the assets allows us more custody and control over how they are utilised for the benefit of the public good. As my colleague Colin Smyth, Colin Smyth from South Scotland mentioned, recognising the model in Dumfries, where expanding cooperative control of that model has realised meaningful and tangible benefits for the community. And that is a model we surely have to husband and try and expand and scale up across the country. Indeed, it's a trend that Scotland once was proud of. In Glasgow alone, there was once eight independent retail cooperative societies in the city with a quarter of a million members and 10% of all retail spend in Glasgow 50 years, 60 years ago. That was swept away in the intervening decades. It's a model we really need to try and rebuild in Scotland. There's only two independent retail cooperative societies left in Scotland, the Scottish Midland, Scott Mid Co Cooperative Society and Clyde Bank. We can use them as a basis to rebuild that amazing infrastructure that captured wealth and kept it within the community and has been siphoned off to whoever knows where around the world by multinational chains. We need to look at that model in a serious way. As we've heard already from Doug Lumsden from North East Scotland and others, the proper funding of local government is also essential to ensuring high streets flourish. And we've seen really good measures um, when it comes to the restoration and regeneration of local high streets, as colleagues have mentioned across the chamber. Frankly, the majority of our high streets in Scotland are not currently places that people want to spend their time. They are often bleak, treeless boulevards um, with steel sh austere shutters on them after hours, and it creates a pretty bleak environment where people don't want to be. So by creating a more pleasant and pleasing environment for residents and visitors, we can attract consumers back to our high streets. Let's ditch the shuttered shop fronts, plastic signage and deserted pavements. We should be emphasising that our local high streets are open for business, welcoming and safe, and sadly, that does not always feel like the case. And I think I'd like to point to a particular example in Glasgow where the heritage shop front improvement schemes in the city have been a standout example of how to address this with schemes currently on the ground in Govan and also in Saracen Street and Postle Park, the latter project which I was delighted to assist with securing funding for in 2018. And Jackie Shearer, uh, the manage, managing uh, partner of the Postle Park Business Improvement District, was last week named as the winner of the Scotland Loves Local Place Lead, uh, Local Leader Awards, which was a fantastic accolade um, in recognising what North Glasgow has achieved uh, in building a better urban environment. And the focus of that has been on kitting out new shop fronts on the once traditional Victorian High Street and then stripping back all that crud, that horrible plastic signage. They've uncovered amazing heritage features, stained glass, hand-painted signage from the Victorian era. And it's actually showing you that by taking that back to that original idea of what a shop should look like, you're actually making it a much more attractive environment. People have been actually stunned by the results for a relatively little investment. So we can do practical things at a small and larger scale to achieve 
these opportunities, but things like the, Her the Heritage Shopfront grants fundings uh, are threatened by local government cuts. Capital availability to continue these kind of grant schemes are limited, but also the measures and planning powers, for example, don't stipulate that people setting up a new shop have to adhere to planning and design standards when it's setting at a shop front. So we end up with cluttered and badly planned uh, local high streets, which contribute to blight and un undesirability. So we need to look at how we use NPF4 to drive better standards, using examples in Scotland where there are really good um, ways of doing that. So along with a fair funding settlement for local government, which we'll Labour has called for for a long time, because we're estimating that one billion is needed to properly fix local government in Scotland, we need to also look at how we design our urban environments to make sure that the uh, NRPF and the planning frameworks are properly resilient enough to ensure best practice is captured and expanded nationally. In, in closing, presenting officer, I welcome the Scotland Loves Local campaign. I think it has huge merit, but I think we know that it doesn't go far enough given the scale which was outlined in the debate today, the scale of the damage caused to our high streets, the scale of the dilution of national ownership, of local ownership, of business ownership in Scotland, ceding it to multinational control. And, uh, I mean, Mr Sweeney will not, because Mr Sweeney is now Right on the closing. cusp of my limits. Sorry, sorry about Thank that. Thank you. Um, you are, you are beyond the cusp of your oh, limits, so, Mr sorry, Sweeney, sorry, and I would be grateful if you would resume uh, your seat. Thank you, okay, Mr Sweeney. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I call on Jamie Halcrow-Johnston to wind up, um, up to seven minutes, Mr Halco johnston The Deputy, Prime, uh, Deputy uh, Presiding Officer was throwing three minutes around earlier. There's a far more rigid approach now. Um, <laughs> thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Never has the support and promotion of local businesses across Scotland been more essential. A pandemic and the associated restrictions brought in on public health grounds have created untold worry and uncertainty for businesses of all sizes. Even those whose doors remained open throughout the were impacted as vital links in supply chains were pulled to breaking point and customer numbers were reduced under the weight of travel restrictions. Staff affected by illness and self-isolation pushed operations across sectors to the brink. It's positive that so many have weathered the storm so far, but we must not forget that there are those that who did not, almost 20,000 in Scotland alone, according to the Federation of Small Businesses. Nor should we overlook the huge cost incurred in interventions in our economy. The value of business support payments and programmes to save jobs, like the UK Government's hugely successful furlough scheme, saw some of the worst potential outcomes avoided, with billions of pounds of support in Scotland alone. Most businesses are more fragile than they've been before. Drawing down on reserves and borrowing, as well as human cost to individuals, have made our enterprises less resilient. What lies ahead remains to be seen. But there is certainly some hope for the future and green shoots of recovery. Tomorrow, the Scottish Government will outline its proposals for next year's budget. And this is a crucial time and a positive response from the Scottish Government, one that creates the conditions for our economy to thrive and to prosper, will, I'm sure, be met with support from across this chamber. The Scottish Conservatives believe support needs to continue. That's why we've called for changes to business rates, giving a freeze on poundage and 75% relief across a number of key sectors. More than ever, we need a budget that backs Scottish businesses. With a local debate, there will be some cause for local reflection. My own region, as highlighted earlier, the Highlands and Islands, is a region not only large in geography, but diverse in spirit. It's difficult to do its economy justice in just a few minutes. What I will say is that one of the privileges of being a member of this parliament is the ability to see local businesses in action, to speak with the people building, creating, and driving action in our local areas. In the Highlands and Islands, we have a disproportionate number of smaller businesses, and they're so often more than just part of our economy. They are absolutely vital to the communities they serve. In our remote and rural communities, we see more directly the contribution they make in terms of employment, access to services, and community life as a whole. They are what tie our communities together. But there have certainly been challenges. In the Highlands and Islands, one of the major limitations is found in infrastructure. At a time when remote working and online retail has become so important, news that the R100 project rollout of broadband in my region is delayed from the end of this year to the end of 2026 is concerning. So too is the apparent lack of certainty within the Scottish Government on the future of duelling schemes for the A9 and the A96, as well as the slow pace at which upgrades on these choke points have taken place. And for our island communities, we saw firsthand this year, and too often in previous years, how the disruption of vital lifeline ferry links harms local businesses and local communities. On a more positive note, the Scotland Loves Local Awards mentioned in today's motion played a positive part in highlighting great things happening in our local areas. 
One of the winners was Nairn, which scooped the climate town of Accolade. And this is well-deserved recognition of the work undertaken by community groups across the town to show how more sustainable approaches to living can work in practice. And it's fitting that this award comes to the Highlands and Islands, which has been leading the charge in Scotland and in the UK as a whole in combating climate change. Business, working with government, academia and other sectors, have made great strides in terms of renewable energy in the north of Scotland, and particularly in my home of Orkney. We're also seeing great local projects where materials are better utilised and recycled, building on our local heritage of reuse, working with the resources available and respecting the land and seas that surround us. That will increasingly be part of doing business, and I'm pleased that the Highlands and Islands is leading the way. But the region also faces the same challenges seen elsewhere too, and many have been touched, up, uh, touched upon in today's debate. More retail has, for understandable reasons, moved online. And what will be essential is ensuring that small and local suppliers are not squeezed out. Our high streets and town centres will need to change, and it will be a matter of more than just a lick of paint and more car parking. Consumer behaviour has shifted, and that shift has been accelerated by the pandemic. We value these hubs of community life, and it must be the priority of any government to ensure they have a future. But sadly, support for small local businesses is not always universal. As has been mentioned today, earlier this week we saw reports of one Scottish producer that was targeted by people out of a misplaced ideology when promoting their goods in England. This has sadly been all too common in Scotland in recent times. And it should serve as a reminder that entrepreneurs put their heart and their soul, as well as their livelihoods, into their enterprises. So what I hope that today all members would recognise the positive work of businesses and condemn the negative and hate-fueled online bigotry that sometimes can blight them. And I think I heard the Minister do exactly that, and I certainly know Jim Fairley did, and that's very welcome. There have been many excellent contributions today. My colleague Douglas Lumpton spoke about the impact of the last two years on business and the sensible support that can be offered, particularly in retail. Few of us can miss the empty units in our commercial areas that he touched on. He also reflected on the role of local authorities. Sadly, however, not only, not only the powers but the resources for council to build positive economic conditions have been curtailed by this government at a time when they're needed most. Morris Golden's contribution focused in more detail on the food and drink sector, citing the issues faced by a number of businesses in his own region. The need for a comp comprehensive review of food policy is long overdue and has enormous potential benefits for Scottish producers. He also spoke of the importance of encouraged trade within the UK, making the local truly national with the support of Scottish trade hubs. Finney Carson highlighted how local businesses increase services, often providing lifeline links for those unable to access um, shops themselves. And this happened across the country, and I'm sure we've all got plenty of examples in our own areas. I certainly can think of many in Orkney. Presiding officer, the prosperity of local economies will not happen simply by warm words. Tomorrow we'll see how far the Scottish Government's commitment to local business is and whether they are listening and able to understand the concerns of those driving forward our economy. I hope Scotland's businesses are not left disappointed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Halcrow Johnson. I now call on Patrick Harvey to wind up. Up to nine minutes, Minister. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. It's been one of those debates which has encouraged members to talk with uh, great pride and enthusiasm about the, uh, the, the produce, the, the businesses and the communities and experiences of their local areas, and rightly so. From cloutey dumplings to Friday nights in Barhead, uh, I'm not sure if those were shared Friday nights. Uh, 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 if not, it's not too late, uh, and I would encourage members to, to continue uh, to tell the stories with enthusiasm about their local communities uh, and what makes them diverse creative and unique places. It's whatever other differences we might have uh, in politics, I think that's something that unites us uh, across the political spectrum, across all political parties. Uh, I think Colin Smith was the, the first to paint that picture about his own uh, local area. Uh, the, the comment about football was the only one I didn't understand, but that says more about me than it does about, about him. But most of this debate has been characterised uh, by positive ideas and positive uh, assertions about the, the value of that creativity and uniqueness uh, in local communities. And I, I welcome that very much. It's almost a tradition in the Parliament that in the debates in the, the days before a budget, uh, opposition amendments uh, are about preempting the budget. And I think the, the political parties uh, understand that the government will not be able to support amendments which do preempt 
tomorrow's budget. But I, I, I welcome the, the positivity that's been uh, evident throughout uh, most of the debate, and I encourage members to maintain that. And if they have positive suggestions for how the government uh, should take its budget through, I'm quite confident that they will come also with proposals about where money should come from, uh, as well as where it will go to. The, the Scotland Loves Local programme uh, is an example of, of something that crosses numerous ministerial portfolios as well. And as, as Tom Arthur said in opening, it's something which will only succeed through collaboration across political parties, ministerial portfolios, uh, across all parts of the government uh, and with the public private and third sectors working together with communities. And if we get that right, the economic benefits uh, will be very evident. Uh, encouraging more people to spend more of their time and money uh, in local businesses will build stronger, vibrant and sustainable communities, breathe life back into town centres and cities uh, and make sure that we're on that road to recovery following the disruption of the pandemic. There's been a lot of emphasis in the debate on retail of course, that's, that's very understandable, uh, including the, the context of online retail. I think it's important to remember, though, as well, that many independent businesses with their roots firmly in their local communities also sell online. And for some, those online sales uh, can be what helps keep them in business, what helps keep their doors open on the high street as well. So we need to encourage and support them uh, to make use of those opportunities. Uh, I want to mention Paul Sweeney's comments towards the end of the debate uh, about the domination of multinationals. I think that's an important point, and it's one, a concern that is shared uh, across many parts of the political spectrum. Uh, it's uh, very clear that there are far too many opportunities for tax avoidance, corporate tax avoidance by those large multinationals. And that's a big driver of what's led to that domination of multinationals on the high street. There are aspects of that that are out with the control of this parliament, but we do want to look uh, at devolved and local taxes, including with the Citizens' Assembly on local government finance that will happen later in this session. So I encourage uh, everyone to engage with that. And the National Strategy for Economic Transformation, uh, which is, is eminent, will also offer opportunities to look at wider business ownership models uh, and the support that they need. As I said, many ministerial portfolios are responsible uh, for, for this uh, agenda and engaged with this agenda. As the active travel minister, understandably, I want to take some time uh, to talk about the way that how we move through our communities is profoundly connected uh, to how we shape them and how, uh, uh, how we're connected to them, uh, at a, at a, uh, in, including the, the businesses that operate within them. Because uh, as, as Emma, Emma Roddick mentioned uh, again towards the end of the debate, the contribution that walking as well as wheeling and cycling, can make uh, to the Scotland Loves Local programme and the localism agenda more widely is extremely important. And the, the concept of 20-minute neighbourhoods, for example. Um, the, the, the role of public transport, too, was, was mentioned. I think it might have been Colin Smith who mentioned uh, that. And I, I, I hope that he's uh, happy to welcome the fact that we're going to see free bus travel for under-22s. And I know that people are pushing for that to be expanded to cover other groups. Uh, and I want to hear those arguments made, but we're uh, making a good start with that, uh, encouraging it uh, and making it available for under 22s. Because making sure that people can access their local communities affordably and sustainably is critical. Uh, walking, cycling uh, and wheeling, of course, are part of uh, a public health approach as well. Uh, and we, we want to make sure that people get the benefits of that active lifestyle. But it's about much more. It's about being connected uh, to a local community. Fiona Hislop uh, mentioned this as well, a, a little bit about talking about measuring success in broader ways. It's not just about uh, direct economic impact. It's about people. It's about their connections and relationships to one another uh, and to, the, to their connections to their place. And, and Colin Beattie also commented uh, in, in the way that this relates to the issues of isolation and mental health. These are really important points. How we are physically connected and moving about through our communities shape far more than just narrow economic metrics. People's travel behaviour and their experience of the transport system differs depending on uh, many factors like income, gender, ethnicity, age, disability, uh, amongst others. And we need to uh, understand these challenges uh, as well. Uh, and our work on the national... Yes, I'll give way. 
Jimmy Helker Johnston. Thank you. I think the Minister forgot geography. And the question I asked Ariane Burgess, I'll ask to yourself how do you ensure that those reliant on cars because of their rurality are able to access our town centres too? Minister. Well, absolutely, they need to be able to do it. I don't know anybody who wants to abolish the private car or make it impossible to use. But we have a car culture which is so dominated uh, by, by uh, the, the predominance of, of the car uh, that many people who don't have one just have no access uh, to the services and the communities that they need. So a great deal of what we need to achieve in a more sustainable transport system is also about a more socially just transport system as well. Uh, as we've heard, 20-minute neighbourhoods uh, are, are based on the, the idea of us living in attractive, safe, walkable places where people of all ages and abilities can access the services and facilities that they need on a daily basis uh, within a walk or wheel of around 20 minutes. And Claire Baker welcomed this concept. I think she was right, though, to say that we've got a, a great deal more to do if we're going to turn that vision into a reality. The Scottish Government's committed to doing that and I hope that we'll have many opportunities to engage constructively uh, with opposition parties to achieve it. I want to mention the Spaces for People programme as well. It was established in the early uh, days of the COVID pandemic in a, a quick response uh, to the need to create safe walking and cycling spaces along with physical, distances, uh, physical distancing. It, it provided many examples of where previously congested streets were transformed for the benefit of people to walk wheel and cycle uh, in their local area. And what we know is that when people move at walking, cycling and wheeling speeds through our communities, they're far more likely to stop, to pop into a shop or a cafe, to speak to their neighbours uh, and to have that direct physical connection uh, at a human level with their local community. Uh, if I've got time, very, very briefly. Colin Smith. Thank you, President. Does the Minister accept that, that one of the consequences of the Spaces for People initiative is that it actually took money away from permanent active travel schemes, and most of the money was actually concentrated on two large cities? So, in fact, investment in permanent schemes in other parts of Scotland did lose out, and that needs to be addressed. In closing, Minister. There, there is a great deal that we will and are learning from the, the Spaces for People of what worked well uh, and what needs to be improved. But the Scottish Government is committed to a massive increase, an unprecedented increase in investment in walking, wheeling and cycling. And we need more than just that infrastructure. We need the behaviour change and culture change that comes with it. We need ac accessibility for bikes and the free bike scheme for, for young people, which is already rolling out pilots uh, across the country, is a big part of that. Uh, I'm sorry that I'm not going to be able to cover everything that I had planned to in my closing speech, but I want to close by thanking once again all members uh, who brought positive and constructive ideas to the table and to this debate uh, and to make sure that we all commit to work together uh, on this agenda because uh, the, the Love Local campaign is about what happens uh, within every community in this country uh, and I think if we all commit to work together on it, uh, we'll improve our country everywhere. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate on Scotland Loves Local. It's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of business motion 2464 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. And I call on George Adam to move the motion. Moved, President Officer. Thank you. No member has asked to speak on the motion. And the question is that motion 2464 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The, mo the motion is therefore agreed. And the next item of business is consideration of three parliamentary bureau motions. And I ask George Adam, on behalf of the parliamentary bureau, to move motions 2465 to 2467 on approval of SSIs. Thank you, President Officer. I all moved. Thank you, Minister. The question on these motions will be put at decision time, and there are four questions to be put as a result of today's business. And can I remind members that if the amendment in the name of Douglas Lumsden is agreed to, then the amendment in the name of Colin Smith will fall. And the first question is that Amendment 2442.2 in the name of Douglas Lumsden, which seeks to amend Motion 2442 in the name of Tom Arthur on Scotland Loves Local, be agreed. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we'll move to a vote and there will be a short suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system.